Aloha, everyone. I'm pleased to be here today at Think Tech Hawaii to interview Steve Phillips. We're going to be talking about the 2016 election and where do we go from here after the surprising results, especially in the presidential election. Uh, Steve Phillips is the founder of Democracy in Color. He's a national political leader, uh, civil rights lawyer, senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. He has written columns in the New York Times and other places, and he is the author of the best-selling Brown is the New White. I have interviewed Steve last year, uh, just before the book actually came out uh, about Brown is the New White. So we'll be following up with some questions uh, relating to some of the demographics and statistics that Steve had in that book. Uh, so welcome, Steve. It's great to have you here again. Great. Thanks for having me back. And uh, so uh, I thought first we'd start uh, talking about what happened. I mean, why did, okay, Donald <laughs> Trump, why did Donald Trump win the Electoral College after all the polls showed mm -hmm. that Hillary Clinton was, was going to win, you know, by quite a bit. So what happened? Well, it's what um, is important to appreciate is how close the election was and that there's like this notion that the whole country has gone crazy and you, know, you could argue whether some, a big chunk of it has, um, but that 77,000 votes in three different states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania is the difference between Trump being president and Clinton being president. And so in an election of 130 million people, mm -hmm. that's 77,000 uh, margin. So we, I don't, we can't, we can't, I think not to overreact, but the consequences are so profound that it's you know, natural to um, see it in this, in this context. So I think my analysis is that a big part of the problem is that the Democrats and progressives allowed Trump to get normalized and to become an acceptable choice. And so some for their number of people who would not have supported him gravitated and for a while the clearest, the most extreme examples after that videotape came out came out about him talking bragging about sexual assault, you had different members of Congress uh, unendorsing him on Friday when it came out, watching the debate on Sunday saying, Oh, he still seems to be standing, and then reendorsing him on, back on Monday. And so the Democrats failed to define him and keep him as an unacceptable choice. So just enough uh, people were able to say, well, it's okay to actually vote for him. He was able to actually squeak through in those three different states. Um, so that, I think, was the fundamental issue. That no longer became a question of, are you going to be with the uh, racist, xenophobic, mis misogynistic candidacy? It's like, oh, it's a Republican nominee, and he says some un you know, controversial things, but overall he's okay. And that he was really issuing this uh, call to arms to uh, uh, you know whites who felt great amount of uh, racial resentment by the country's changing demographics and unapologetically appealing to those sentiments um, and the Democrats were saying well he doesn't have the temperament to be president and it was just the wrong approach they did not draw a line in the sand did not force people to take a stand did not tell people that you have to respond to this threat in a countervailing fashion that is on the scale of what he was proposing. Okay, so you're saying that there were, that really if there had been 77,000 votes the other way, that he would not be president. Exactly. He, and so what states were those in? Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Okay, so what should the Democrats have done in those three states? So they somewhat got caught because the demographic shift in the country is to the south and southwest in terms of more democratic leaning voters, particularly voters of color. And it's away, and the, the overall population trends, and away from the, the what we call the Rust Belt, the in, industrial Midwest. And so they didn't go deep enough and hard enough and fast enough into the south and southwest. So they lost uh, Arizona by about 90,000 votes. 600,000 Latinos didn't vote in Arizona. Um, and then they, they neglected their, you know, your, your rear flank around those different states. We lost uh, Michigan by 10,000 votes, um, Wisconsin by 22,000 votes, and um, uh, about 40 or so in, in, in Pennsylvania. 
So, and each of those were a little bit different. And so, but it was, I think, somewhat with the lack of attention to those areas, you have to hold your base. And the, um, um, like in Wisconsin, it actually was a lot of the progressives and progressive whites who voted third party. It wasn't that everybody defected over to Trump. The people who, had, the people who voted for Obama uh, said, well, I don't really like Clinton, I'm going to vote third party. Mm. And there was a large number, almost like 150,000 people voted third party in, uh, uh, in Wisconsin. So you saw that type of situation. And then in, and then in uh, Pennsylvania, African-Americans were not sufficiently inspired and organized and, motiv and motivated to turn out. So you had a drop in African-American vote. That accounts for a lot of that uh, failure there. And then in Michigan, it does seem like there was some uh, switching. And I think that people have to go deep, more deeply in Michigan. Michigan was the biggest surprise in the primary, primary uh -huh. season, um, where they thought the polls were off. And so clearly something was going on there that was not spoken to. And there were a number of white defections from uh, uh, people who had voted for Democrats in the past switching over to Trump. Um, in uh, in Michigan, so it's a little bit different in each area. So they like just enough things went wrong, so that they could slide in through that sliver of a window that actually was created. So. Well, I've read some other political commentators, and it seems like perhaps they're not really agreeing with you. Like uh, what's his name, Nate Silver at the New York Times. Nate Cohn. Nate Cohn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he. Well, before the election, he was definitely predicting a landslide for. Hillary Clinton, and then it seemed like after the election, now he's taken up this new theme, which is that there are more white voters, and that 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 was what led to the result of the election. What do you think about his analysis? Yeah, I mean, it's it's unfortunate. I mean, he's invested a lot of time, energy, and resources in staking out a position, and then now he's trying. He tries to like defend that position as the core analysis. And I wrote a piece on our, uh, our website, Democracy in Color, basically refuting the big picture conclusions he's saying. And, and I was saying, he's saying, oh, there are more white voters than you think. But at the same time, the Pew Research Center has come out saying that this is the, there are more people of color eligible to vote than ever possible. So how do you reconcile these two types of things? And so what he's looking at is different particular data sets and all of the data about how people of color vote is um, rough at best. Mm -hmm. and so he's picking from that and then saying, so you look at, the, he thinks the exit polls undercount the number of white voters that there were, or white working class voters in 2012. But at the same time, as he looks over at the census data, and the census data is good, but the census data shows more people saying they voted than the actual votes were reported. And so there's problems with that data set as well. So you have to kind of reconcile it all and try to harmonize it all. And he's a, taking advantage of those discrepancies to say, oh, well, there's more white voters. Um, that's actually not the fundamental conclusion of what actually happened, certainly at the national level, and that uh, uh, Clinton lost a million white voters from what Obama had. Trump only picked up 300,000 of those. The other 700,000 went third party. So mm -hmm. it's not like there's this huge infusion but in some particular places, there was a surge. In Florida and Pennsylvania, a lot more white voters did come out than people expected. Um, and that did account for those particular results. And what about uh, voters of color? I mean, how many voters of color did Barack Obama get? And how many do we think that Hillary Clinton got? So it's both the number and the share. And so the uh, Latino vote was about the same, but not actually increased somewhat. Um, but the African American vote was down. Um, by uh, like six percentage points in terms of what the uh, 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 total black turnout was. But m equally important was the share. And so Obama um, got 94% of the black vote. Um, Clinton got 88% um, of the black vote. And then there's a lot of some dispute around the Latino numbers, but it certainly seems that Obama had 73% and Clinton would get 67 some people are saying she got more than that, but still there was some level of drop off of the share. So Trump was able, and the third parties as well. So there was a fair amount of um, alienation or lack of enthusiasm that led people um, to take these other routes. Um, and then just the, it's almost like this, you know, the perfect storm combination. Just enough places, just enough things went wrong that he was able to slide through. Well, um, do you think that the Democratic Party 
mm, sort of took for granted that people of color were going to vote for a Democrat? Oh, absolutely. And so when the, and that's just the Democratic Party. It's really the whole progressive movement, including the super PACs, the outside allied groups. So mm -hmm. when the first uh, $150 million was laid, uh, uh, articulated on what the progressive side was going to do on the independent side, not the campaign. Uh -huh. There was zero dollars allocated for black voter mobilization. There was a little bit for black radio and digital, and some Latino media, but zero for black voter mobilization. Um, I actually wrote a piece in The Nation on that, or are black voters invisible to the Democratic Party? And then similarly on the vice presidential pick. I mean, that was a, a political calculation around how would the politics of it play. And mm -hmm. so they want, they, there's a piece in the New York, uh, you know, line in the New York Times article that they wanted to try to appeal to the white male voters in the Midwest and in the, um, you know, border southern states. And that's why they went with Tim Kaine. But that, the only time we have actually won, and now in every single national election since 2008 is when there's been a black person on the ticket. And so that, they could have gone with Cory Booker, they could have gone with um, uh, Tom Perez, um, a number of other people, but they didn't. And so that played a role in terms of the taking for granted or the, doing the calculation that the way to win actually was to more heavily invest in on that shrinking sector, which is the uh, moderate conservative white uh, swing voter. Okay, well, this is a perfect opportunity for us to take a break, and we're going to hear from our sponsor, Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, it is a perfect opportunity because when we get back, we're going to talk about where do we go from here. So I think some of the things that you've just mentioned, Steve, about uh, how to uh, get the people of color more mobilized to get out and vote and to vote for Democrats will be what we'll be talking about in our next sector. So thank you. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what is likeable about science. We bring on scientists of all ilk, astronomers, physicists, chemists, biologists, ecologists, and they talk about their work, and more importantly, they talk about why you should talk about their work, why you should think about their work, why you should like their work. I help them bring out why their work is understandable, why it's meaningful, why people should care about it, why people should support science. We have a good time. We talk about current uh, events of interest. We talk about uh, historical events sometimes. We dig deep into their research, why they do, what the joys and delights and frustrations of their work are. And in all, we, we show a, a real world of science, a real world of likable science. I hope you'll join us every Friday at 2 p.m. Aloha. Welcome back to our very interesting discussion about the election in 2016. I mean, yes, and what happened? What did happen? Okay, so uh, that was then. And what do we have to do next? We have to look to the future. So, Steve, I'd like to talk to you about where do we go from here? What are we going to do? I mean, you know, these presidential elections are very expensive, and we know the DNC alone spent a billion dollars on advertising and other activities. Um, and Donald Trump didn't spend anywhere near that amount. Mm -hmm. So it sort of looks like uh, maybe the investment made wasn't uh, prioritized in the right kind of way, and people didn't really have the kind of game plan that they needed to address society as we find it today. So what do you think, Steve? What do we need to do? Yeah, no, definitely the money was not spent well um, uh, in the aggregate. You know, I had a, a chapter on my book called Invest Wisely, and we're looking at investing in growing markets, uh, which is the communities of color population, um, investing in effective and proven techniques, and there's very little data that the uh, the exorbitant amount expended on television ads is actually effective in this election. If it proved nothing else, prove that. Um, is that we spent over a billion dollars and lost to a guy on Twitter, right? <clears throat> and so you have that um, reality. So we have to have leadership of the Democratic Party, which is going to look at how to spend that money more effectively, and that's going to invest in the communities which are most democratic and fastest growing. And so we need to have significant on-the-ground presence, 
uh, sinking roots in the communities, partnering with community organizations, faith leaders, and then doing that particularly in the areas that are the growing areas, the, the swing states and the areas that are going to be coming into uh, competitiveness, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina, um, and even Texas, in that uh, we lost this Texas election by about 600,000 votes. There are four million eligible non-voting people of color in Texas. Mm -hmm. And so what are we doing to solve those problems? That's the wave of the future. And then I feel like there's ha we have to be moving on multiple fronts and that there has to be as much resistance as possible to the bad things that yeah, may come and likely will come from this administration. But we also have to have more of a longer term uh, plan and program. How do we build building blocks in the local and state level? Look at mayor's races and district attorney's races in Arizona and Georgia and North Carolina and Florida. Use those as underpinnings to build capacity to turn out voters and then look at the governor's races in those different states. There are going to be exciting candidates of color running for uh, governor likely in Florida and Georgia and Arizona. And can we get behind those in 2018 and get behind those candidacies? And that can all provide the underpinnings for then being able to contest and take back the White House and Congress in 2020. So those are kind of the steps we have to move along the way. And we look at the policy agenda is that are we going to actually put forward uh, a compelling policy agenda which more targets Wall Street and the 1% around being able to move money, have like a new GI Bill that can hopefully peel back some of the white working class vote in those key states um, that we did lose. Well, I mean, some people say that part of the, the fault of what happened was Barack Obama's, that he ignored uh, the white working class voters. Uh, what do you think about that Well, it's criticism? so funny because people keep saying that and um, they skip over the reality that Trump won the white non-working class voters. <laughs> and so uh -huh. what's the analysis of that? And how was, what's their economic pain that wasn't actually being spoken to? So people don't appreciate the centrality and the pervasiveness of racism in our society. And it's in, you know, infused mm -hmm. in the fabric of the country and the culture, and it influences that no Democrat has, for a president has won the white vote since LBJ signed the Immigration Act and the, and the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965. And so we have to come to terms with the fact that there is a ceiling in the context of uh, this country's racial history um, around what is even possible. You can't just blame Barack Obama for not appealing to this grouping. Um, when in fact he's provided uh, health care to millions of people within that grouping, right? So that's an uh, unfounded and inaccurate analysis. Well, if, if, you know, the threat to change Medicare is followed through, uh, the Republicans might find that they've lost a lot of middle class white voters. Um, well, uh, let's go to Florida just for a minute. Um, you know, I, I kept reading that and hearing that uh, Hillary Clinton had like such a terrific on the ground program going in Florida and that Trump had basically nothing going on. So that seems to uh, be a little bit different than what you're saying. You're when you say, well, we got to really get on the ground, and Florida is one of those states where we, we got to do that. So what was wrong with the program that the D DNC and Hillary Clinton did have going on in Florida? So, well, first of all, Florida's always been close. And so Bush v. Gore, 537 votes, when in fact there were, what, 5,000 votes thrown out in uh, Palm Beach. So going back to you know, the 2000 race, uh, Obama won Florida, it was the single closest state Obama won in 2012. He won by 74,000 votes. So it's always been close. Hillary actually did improve on Obama's numbers. Mm -hmm. And so you had a combination of uh, some level of defection towards third party voters. And, you, and then at the bottom line, I think people don't appreciate it. People did respond to Trump's appeal what he was, the words were make America great again. A lot of people were hearing make America white again. And that people responded to that appeal at, in some level of larger numbers than we actually appreciated. But the Hillary operation actually did hit its numbers, but there was actually was even more support 
came out for Trump. And so that gets back to the point around, does the party leadership ref both reflect the diversity of the, of the Democratic voters, 46% of whom are people of color, but also are they experienced in explicitly dealing with racial issues? And that's really what happens. We don't have the, it, almost all the top organizations were won by whites, and very few of them have any experience dealing with things racially explicitly. And so when Trump has, is a, putting that right on the table, they froze and didn't know what to say. And that's one of the interesting things about Hawaii is that there's such multiple uh, racial groups and the history here in this state of really having to think about how do the, all the different groups fit together and how, what is the policy and the politics that relate to that, and it's very much on the table, whereas the rest of the country doesn't have that comfort and familiarity. And in that context, they were caught flat-footed mm -hmm. when there was the kind of appeal that Trump put out. Right. Well, here, of course, we don't. We, our Senate is all Democrat. We don't even have one Republican in our Senate. <laughs> so, uh, along those lines, well, let's take uh, a few examples of how you have implemented the ideas that you're talking about of really getting on the ground and getting people of color out to vote. I know that you worked very hard on Barack Obama's campaign, and you also worked on Kamala Harris's campaign and Cory Booker. Uh, so what did you do? What, what was your magic formula that uh, was well thought out but, and led to success? So the building blocks are to have local community-based organizations and leaders who have credibility in their community and who understand how to organize and then translate that energy and activism into electoral uh, participation, voter registration, voter mobilization. And so that's really the core of this. And this is the things we had done when we did the Obama work in 08, when we worked with Cory Booker, is we found the local leaders and the local groups mm -hmm. and connected with them who already have pre-existing sets of relationships. And we move resources to them. And that's where I think the party has to make this shift. If there should be partnerships with all of these different faith-based leaders, community-based leaders who have mm -hmm. networks, and there should be like an old-fashioned precinct system where you have people taking responsibility. There's a, a professor at uh, Berkeley, Lisa Garcia Bedoya, uh, I think like say she's literally written a book on Latino politics, it's called Latino Politics, and she talks about this concept of the civic web. And so I have a piece up of describing that on our um, Democracy in Color site, where you have teams of people who are responsible for working with like 150, 200 people, day in and day out, year round. So we need to fund that kind of operation where it exists and then where it doesn't exist, you need to create it. So in places like Texas, Texas Organizing Project works in that type of a fashion. Georgia, the New Georgia Project works in that type of fashion, doing voter registration, voter mobilization, getting people out to the polls. That's not what the Democratic Party's been about. It's been about running 30 second television ads in the final weeks of a campaign, rather than investing in those types of groups and leaders. And that's the main strategic shift that we have to make. So uh, you were talking earlier about how all the people in charge of making these kinds of decisions of where we're going to spend a billion dollars within the DNC and then the other billion and a half that was spent by allied organizations and everything, that those decisions on how to spend the money basically were, were made by uh, people who, uh, you know, aren't in, as in is experienced in dealing with racism and other things like that. So I know that you have an effort going right now with the DNC, and could you just tell us about that? Right, so we're, we're participating with different groups and activists around Democracy in Color campaign, uh, which is at democracyincolor.org, around trying to push the Democratic Party entities to hire and promote people who are more expert in functioning in a multiracial society. And so we were very active around pushing around, making sure that the, the, the House Democrats, Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, continued to keep the young Latino, uh, Ben Ray Lujan from New Mexico, in a leadership position mm -hmm. instead of displacing him um, with um, you know, somebody who could appeal to the white working class um, men. Um, and then so we've had a number of discussions around the Senate side, and then we're gonna do a forum with the candidates for Democratic, the DNC chair, to really hear from all of them. We're gonna to try to broadcast this nationally, probably do it on Facebook Live, um, partner with different organizations. We're talking like Daily Coast site around partnering up around this so that the grassroots can participate in 
engaging with the people who want to be leadership of the party and ask them what is their plan. Are they going to be mainly about television ads and, the, and targeting the, the swing voter, or are they going to move resources, build capacity in the community, promote pushing forward an inspiring agenda, which will get people activated and mobilized, and try to get whoever is elected chair committed to that agenda. And so that forum um, will be in mid-January, and so that's how we're continuing to try to help restructure the party, how it rebuild out of the ashes of this election. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, mahalo nui loa. That was really a great analysis of the 2016 election. And I'm especially pleased to hear some of your ideas for going forward, which are very much needed. And I'll be watching very closely to see what happens at the DNC and who gets elected. I hope we can also include some young, younger people in the, in the lineup. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. This was an incredibly interesting interview. And aloha from Think Tech Hawaii.